Okay, tonight's topic is the Trinity and Satan. Uh, it sounds like two completely different topics, but uh, as we'll see, they're actually quite related. They're very uh, intimately related topics. Uh, let's just begin by understanding at least, and at least laying out uh, the Christian perspective. Uh, from a Christian point of view, and you should know that what I'm going to be describing now is fairly widespread amongst all Christians. I mean, that there are not a lot of things that all Christians agree upon, but what I'm going to be describing now is fairly widespread among all flavors of Christianity. You'd have to look pretty far and wide. You have to sort of spend a lot of time searching for Christians that may not accept what I'm about to share with you. So number one, the Christian concept of God is that God is composed of what they refer to as three persons. Three persons in, I don't like this word, but it's referred to as the Godhead. So somehow there is God, right? And this God is composed of three persons. Uh, these persons are not obviously in absolute unity. It's three distinct persons, what they refer to as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so therefore, their concept of God is not what we as Jews refer to as an absolute unity, but they refer to as a tri-unity. Their concept of God is a tri-unity, often called Trinity, right, or Trinitarian. And they believe that these three persons are of the same substance. They believe that they're of the same substance, uh, and basically they make up their, the Christian concept of God. So the idea of the belief in God as a trinity is fairly standard among just virtually all Catholics, almost all Protestants. Now just so we can zoom in on the, the Son, on the Jesus part, so I just want to make it clear that Christians believe that Jesus is God incarnate. That's the basic belief, that Jesus, the human being that was born 2,000 years ago in Israel, that he was God incarnate, meaning God, right? The, the, what part of God is, I guess it's the son part of God, became incarnate. It became uh, embedded in the flesh of this human being. Uh, and again, they see the son, Jesus, as ultimately of one substance with God. And therefore, Christians refer to Jesus as both fully human and fully God. He was fully human, a fully human being, and completely and entirely God at the same time. Now, it's obviously a bit of a logical contradiction. You cannot be, at the same time, fully human and fully God, because someone that's entirely human is not God, right? I'm fully human, I'm entirely human, I, I'm not God at the same time. So, by definition, if you're fully human, you're not God, right? And if you're Fully divine, you're not human. But the Christian assertion is that Jesus is both fully human and fully divine. Many Christians refer to this as a mystery of the church, right? It's a mystery of the church. Tertullian famously said, I believe because it's absurd. Meaning that Tertullian was basically saying that if the doctrines of Christianity made perfect sense, there'd be no virtue in believing them. Meaning that if it made perfect sense, what would be the virtue in believing it? So for Tertullian, the fact that it doesn't make sense and that it's actually a mystery and, and strange and bizarre and even self-contradictory, for him that becomes part of the virtue of belief, I believe because he said it's absurd. And therefore, again, from a Christian perspective, their idea of the Messiah, this personality in the Bible, for Christians the Messiah is divine. For Christians the Messiah, again, is God. Now, those are the three concepts that we're going to be examining tonight. Specifically, is that what the Jewish Bible teaches? Does the Jewish Bible teach clearly and consistently that God is triune? Is that the basic thrust of the Jewish Bible, that we are to understand God as having these three parts, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Does the Bible clearly teach that God at some point in human history would take on human form and become a human being, essentially? And does the Jewish Bible teach that the Messiah were to understand the Messiah as being God 
in the flesh, as divine. Now, those are the three things we're going to examine. There are many reasons, and this is not really the time to examine this fully, but just want to share just a few introductory thoughts, that there are many reasons why that could account for why these concepts developed within Christianity. Uh, one of the things that I think can be demonstrated is that these are not ideas that existed at the very beginning of the Jesus movement. I think there's ample evidence to show that the followers of Jesus, the people that were his immediate group, did not worship him as God. They didn't think that he was God, they didn't worship him as God. Whether they thought of him as a special human being, not clear. They obviously thought of him as a, a great person, but what's fairly clear is that the idea that he is divine develops only later on in the history of Christianity. Um, what led to that? And again, there are many, many, many theories as to what led to it. Let me just share a few ideas. Number one, we came, we have seen previously that Christianity really begins with a redefinition of the concept of Messiah. Right? In the Jewish scriptures, Messiah is essentially going to be a human king who rules the Jewish people. He's the king of the Jewish people at the time when the world has reached its utopian zenith, its apex, right? When the world has been perfected into a utopia of universal peace and universal knowledge of God. That's basically the Jewish concept of the Messiah. It's very clear that Jesus didn't accomplish that. And that's, that leads to the Christian doctrine of the second coming, meaning the, the Christian notion that Jesus has to return to accomplish all these things is an admission that he didn't do it when he was here. But what happened is that we all know Jesus did not return. And the, the people who developed this concept of Jesus returning to finish the, the job, they were expecting him not in a thousand years or 500 years or even 200 years, they were expecting him in that generation. So when he failed to return in that generation to bring about the utopian uh, age, there was a crisis, and, and how do you maintain your belief in him? So it led to essentially a redefinition of the messianic concept as one where the Messiah is supposed to die. And he dies essentially as an atonement, as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. If people would believe in him, all their sins could be forgiven. Now, the question that arises is very obvious. What would be so special about his death? There were about 100,000, at least 100,000 Jews that the Romans crucified. So why is his death so unique? So that might be one of the elements that led to the idea that because that person on the cross was not a normal, regular human being, that was God, right, on the cross. Second thing to understand is that we'll see later tonight that Paul, who writes most of the uh, letters and epistles where these ideas come from, where the ideas of the uh, exaltation, the elevation of Jesus basically begin in the letters of Paul, it's quite possible that even Paul did not see Jesus as God. It's not clear. You certainly could read Paul's letters in both ways. But if, even if we made the argument that Paul didn't actually get to the point of deifying Jesus and saying that Jesus is God in the flesh, but he comes fairly close, and his language is ambiguous, and even the Christian Bible says that Paul's writings are difficult to decipher. And so he, in his own mind, may not have meant to give the impression that Jesus was God in the flesh, but it's quite possible that the non-Jewish readers of Paul's letters Basically, Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. So the people that were his followers and students, they may not have fully and accurately understood exactly what he had in mind. And it would have been very easy for them to misunderstand Paul and take his writings as indicating that Jesus was God. Now, why would it be that his readers might easily misunderstand Paul? This is very obvious. Because if we're at all familiar with the ancient Greco-Roman world, the ancient world of pagan and Hellenistic Rome and Greece, we know that the idea of exalted human beings who were considered to be God was rampant. 
in the Roman world, right, the emperors were seen as divine and there were all these gods and Zeus and Apollo and it was basically a world where there were plenty of gods and plenty of human beings were seen as divine. And it would have been difficult to imagine starting a religion where the major character of the religion was less than a god. Because if you were in a world back then where every emperor and many other people were gods, so it would be difficult to sell a religion where the focus of the religion is less than God. So the idea of, for example, a supernatural divine savior who comes to the world, who's born of a virgin, and who dies as an atonement, these were concepts that were very, very prevalent in the ancient world. They were not unique to Christianity. We see these ideas anticipated in the Mithraic cults, in Dionysus, in Isis. Many of the cults back then, the pagan Hellenistic cults, had these ideas of a supernatural divine being who comes to earth, who is a, human, who is a savior of human beings, born of a virgin, dies a vicarious death, etc. So it, it's not difficult to understand why, even though we're going to see tonight, these ideas have absolutely no currency in the Jewish worldview. These are ideas that are completely foreign to the Jewish Bible and would have been completely foreign to any Jew living 2,000 years ago, but they were very, very familiar themes to Gentiles in the Greco-Roman world. So it's not difficult to understand why it is that ultimately Jesus came to be seen as divine. One of the things that would be profitable, and again, we don't have uh, an endless amount of time to cover this topic, but one of the things that would be profitable would be to examine where do Christians try to substantiate these ideas from? We saw that Christians try to argue that they have hundreds of proofs from the Jewish Bible that prove that Jesus was the Messiah. That was one of the earlier lectures in this series. They claim, many of them, that there are over 300 prophecies. Some Christians even maintain there are over 600 prophecies. But we saw that Christians were very adept at plowing through, mining through the entire Jewish Bible to find little sound bites to pull them out of context, or to misquote them, or even mistranslate them, or even in some cases invent passages that don't even exist, to substantiate their idea that Jesus was the Messiah. The same exact procedure took place when they tried to, again, prove that Jesus was divine, and that the Messiah is supposed to be divine. And one of the things that I recommend you meet, try as, a, as an assignment, as a project, is to do the following. Just go, th it's a big project, Go through the entire Tanakh. Start at the beginning, go to the very end. And simply note passages that speak about God, where the context of the passage is describing God and the nature of God. Right? It's not that hard to do. You just read through the Bible, and maybe you, you get a yellow highlighter, or you get a, magic, you write, you get a, uh, a pen and you write the letter, the letter G, however you do it, but you get a whole set of passages where any person, if they landed from Mars, or they just learned English and they were coming from another country, anyone reading the text of the Bible would recognize this passage, the theme, the context. What the passage is dealing with is trying to teach us who is God and what's the nature of God. When you do that and you go through all of those passages, you'll see something very interesting. Not one of them even hints, even hints obliquely at the idea that we're to understand God as having three parts or, to, or we're to understand God as coming and taking on human form. I mean that none of the Christian beliefs about God are reflected in any of the passages in the Bible where the context of the passage is talking about God and how we're to understand God. And if you look at all the passages that Christians marshal, you'll find that they're coming from passages where the context of the passage is not discussing who is God. I'll share with you one example. One of the most popular passages that Christians like to point to is from the 18th chapter in the book of Genesis, in Bereshit. So 
the story takes place after the circumcision of Abraham. Abraham has been circumcised in the previous chapter. And in the beginning of chapter 18, God appears to Abraham. The rabbis teach that God appeared to visit the sick. Abraham is uh, you know, not an eight-day-old boy. He's a man in his upper 90s. It's probably not easy back then to go through a circumcision. And so Abraham is uh, clearly not feeling great. So God comes to appear to him. And in the midst of this divine visitation, God has just appeared to Abraham. We're told that Abraham lifts up his eyes. He looks up and he sees three men. He sees three men. He basically says to God, God, I'm going to have to put you on hold. He'll excuse me, God, but I have important work to do, right? What do I do as Abraham? Abraham was someone who was hospitable. He was always looking for ways of helping people. So Abraham basically says to God, please wait here. I'm going to go and run and take care of these three men. You should know that in the Bible, any time the number three comes up, Christians, almost like a reflex action, assume three trinity. That's almost an automatic reflex. So what happens here in this passage is that uh, he takes care, he serves these three men who turn out to be angels. And two of the men leave. Two of the men go to Sodom after they are uh, taken care of by Abraham. And at the end of the passage, it describes Abraham as standing in the presence of God. So the Christian argument is that there were three angels, or three men, two of them left, and now the Bible describes Abraham as standing in the presence of God. So that leads the Christian to assert that these were three men, and one of the men is called God. So they, they say this is a proof that God can take on human form. Again, there are many, many ways of reading this story uh, that, does, that don't support the Christian reading. The simplest one is, is like this. One of the things that we see throughout the Bible is that God tells us that he will sometimes relate to us as human beings through the agency of an angel. And when the angel comes to speak to human beings, the angel speaks in the name of God. So the Bible describes the angel's speech as God speaking, even though it's clear that it's not God, it's the angel that's speaking. So this is, again, one of many, many stories where Christians look to the story, see there's an angel, and see the angel described in divine terms, and say, therefore, this angel that had, they're assuming some form if they interacted with people, right? that proves that God can take on human form. So the point I wanted to make now was, again, not to try to read the story and explain why the Christians are misreading it, but to point out that if you were to read chapter 18 of Genesis and ask yourself, this is the key question, what's the topic of this chapter? If I was to assign eighth grade class, give this chapter a title. What, what's going on in this chapter? So anyone reading this chapter would not say that the theme of chapter 18 of Genesis is how to understand God. Who is God? The chapter is clearly a chapter dealing with how Abraham takes care of guests. It's a whole chapter that focuses on how kind he, he I mean, it's amazing. It's talking about every other word. He runs, he gets up, he's, uh, you know, an old man that's just been circumcised, and yet he does everything himself. He prepares all the food, he's running around. And what's clear is that the focus of this chapter is on Abraham's hospitality and kindness. It's not at all a chapter who's concerned with teaching us about who is God and the nature of God. So I want you to just bear in mind that this test applies really to all the material you'll find. That the Jewish sources that we're going to be looking at tonight are sources that are teaching and talking about who is God, what's the nature of God. Whereas the Christian sources are invariably from passages where the context is not dealing with understanding who is God. There are, as you probably know, many, many famous uh, appeals that Christians make to the Jewish Bible. One of the most famous ones, for example, is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, where God says, let us make man in our image. Right? And somehow this phrase, let us make man, again, supposedly proves the Christian idea of the Trinity. Now this assertion 
is really so weak. Someone asked before about Christian scholars. You should know that most Christian scholars, even the most Trinitarian Christian scholars say, this passage has absolutely nothing to do with the Trinity. They will either say that this passage where God says, let us make man in our image, they refer to it either as God addressing the celestial beings in heaven. So in, in the creation of man, God addresses the angels, the heavenly court, and God speaks to the angels and says, let us create man. The rabbis say that what God is doing basically is teaching an ethical lesson that when we do something, we should consult with our subordinates. Or, and this is not just a Jewish assertion, many Christian commentaries, the most conservative evangelical ones say, that's what's going on here, that God is addressing the angels. Other Christian commentaries, as well as Jew Jewish commentaries say, this is what's referred to as the uh, plural of majesty. That we see examples in the Bible where a king will speak in the plural. In Daniel, there's a passage where the king says, what shall we do, right? He didn't become all of a sudden a person with split personalities. But it's common, editorial writers will speak in the we, it's called the editorial we, and royalty will speak, what will we do? So in the Bible, God says, let us create man. Those are the two most popular theories in terms of explaining why the Bible would say, let us create man. Christians, believe it or not, also appeal to the central passage of Jewish theology, the Shema, which says, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, which simply, basically says that God is one, and yet Christians assert, no, this teaches the Trinity. That the passage in the Bible, the Shema, teaches the Trinity. Why? Because if you read the passage, it says, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. These three names for God, Adonai and Elohim, mentioned three times in the verse, they're one, right? They're all one. And they assert that the word echad, this is their claim, that in the Bible, one does not mean one in the sense of an absolute unity, but they'll say that the word echad means a, a compound unity. So for example, in Genesis, it says that every man will therefore leave his mother and father and cleave unto their wife and become one flesh, basar echad. So they say, you see, basar echad is not an absolute unity. There are two people that become one flesh. So that's their assertion, that the passage in, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohim, Adonai Echad, teaches the Trinity. Now, it's hard to know even where to begin deconstructing this. First of all, it would have been better from a Christian point of view had it said, Shema Yisrael, Av Ben Ruach, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they're one. But it, it refers to God as Adonai, and then it says this Adonai, which is almost the proper name of God, is our God. And then it says again, Adonai Echad. So there are two references to Adonai, one to Elohim. So why would a trinity be expressed as two and one? But more importantly, the Christian asserts that the word Echad is a compound unity. Is that really true? So the fact is that in the Bible, it is used occasionally as a compound word, that sometimes you have several things which make up one unit, but most frequently the word echad in the Bible means one, simply one. Uh, there's a passage in Ecclesiastes, Kohelet, which says, and they're one and not two. And there are many times when the Bible might say there was one cow. So when it says one cow, it's telling you there's one, and it's not a compound unity. So the question is, if the word echad can mean a compound unity, or echad can mean an absolute unity, how do you know which one it is? How do you know how to interpret it? So you would interpret it the same way you interpret the word one in English, the Hebrew word echad, and the English word one. What does the word one mean? So sometimes one can be a compound unity, right? That the man and woman would become one flesh, or you and me, we're one. Right? We're, we're like as one together. So you have sometimes the word one can mean a group of things that are described as one. And sometimes the word one simply means what it normally means, one. This is one book. I have one head on my shoulders, right? There's uh, one watch on the desk in front of me. It's not a compound unity. 
So how do you know whether the word echad or one is an absolute unity or a compound unity? The answer is very simple. You follow the context of the passage. The context will tell you if it's dealing with a compound of different elements or it's talking about one thing. And if you go through the Bible, and the Bible we know always is interpreted in light of other scripture, the Bible is never telling us that God is somehow a compound unity. God is described as simply one. And we'll see the Bible makes it imminently clear that God is not to be understood as a compound unity. So Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 35. Unto you it was shown that you might know that the Lord, he is God, there is none else beside him. Now, one of the reasons this passage is so incredibly important is this passage really took place before the Jewish people even had a Bible. Again, it's not, it was not revealed to us, the Jewish people, that God, that the Lord is God, there's none beside him, by reading this in a memo. We didn't find out about this by reading it in the Bible. The Torah tells us here that God showed this to us. God demonstrated to us, and it was done through the experience of his revelation at Mount Sinai. At Mount Sinai, God demonstrated to us in a very visceral and real fashion who he is, and more specifically, who he's not. And what it's saying on some level is that whatever we did not experience, whatever was not shown to us at Mount Sinai is not God. So the important thing to remember is that at Mount Sinai, there's not one report in all of Jewish history that even one person came down from Mount Sinai and told their children and told their later generations, you know what, God was revealed to us in human form, or that we experience God as having three parts. So the important thing is that Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 35 is telling us that God showed us, showed us who he was and who he wasn't. And any understanding, any concept of God that our ancestors did not experience, that we refer to as idolatry. And in verse 39, the passage goes on to say, Know therefore this day, and consider it in your hearts, that the Lord, he is God, in heaven above and upon the earth beneath, there is none else. Now, what is this passage not telling you? I mean, here you read Deuteronomy 4, it's obviously two verses speaking about God and God's nature. What it doesn't talk about is God having three parts. What it doesn't talk about is God having human form. It's not making any attempt, and we'll see this is true for all the verses we're going to be studying. They don't make any attempt to help us understand the Christian concept of the deity. None of these passages make any attempt to try to show us that the Christian idea of God is the correct one. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 60. So that all the peoples of the earth shall know that the Lord is God, there is no other. There's nothing else other than the Lord that you experienced at Mount Sinai. Deuteronomy chapter 6, we just read this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. Adonai Echad. It could have said here, Three in one. It could have said that we should understand God as being Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This would have been a perfect passage, a perfect verse for the Bible to express a Christian concept of the deity. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 39. See now that I, even I, am He, and there is no God with me. I kill, I make alive, I wound, and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. Here again, a verse where God is speaking about himself. God is the subject of this verse. Nothing in the verse that speaks about Christ, uh, a God in Christian terms. Isaiah 42, I am the Lord, in verse 8, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Isaiah 43, verse 10, God says about the Jewish people, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Again, 
reading this kind of passage, no indication, no clue, not even oblique, not an oblique clue that we're to understand God as a trinity or as having physical form. Isaiah 44, verse 6, thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. Hosea chapter 13, verse 4, Yet I am the Lord your God from the land of Egypt, and you shall know no God but me, for there is no Savior beside me. Isaiah 46, verse 9, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Isaiah 45, verse 5 and 6, I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded you, through, though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. In verse 18, For thus says the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he has established it, he created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. This would have been a wonderful chapter for God to introduce concepts of the Trinity or the Incarnation, but it's not there. Exodus 33, God tells us that he cannot be seen because he's not physical. Exodus 33, verse 20, and he said, you cannot see my face for there shall be no one who can see me and live. It's impossible to see God. There's nothing to see as we'll see later on in Deuteronomy chapter 4. You can't see God because there's nothing to be seen. Ezekiel chapter 28. Will you say yet before him that slays you, I am God? Right? Will a human being be able to, to tell the person killing them that you're God? But you shall be a man and no God in the hand of him that slays you. You shall die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers, for I have spoken it, says the Lord God. This was actually submitted to you playfully. In the past, we've gone through Christian proof texts that try to prove that Jesus was the Messiah or Jesus was God. This could easily be submitted as a Jewish proof text, showing that someone claiming to be God is just a human being and will die the death of the uncircumcised. The Romans were uncircumcised. They crucified many such people. In the book of Nehemiah, chapter 9, verse 6, You, even you, are Lord alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and all things that are therein, the seas and all that is therein, and you preserve the all and the host of heaven worship you. Actually, if you read the book of Nehemiah, the entire chapter 9, it's a huge chapter all about God. I didn't submit the whole chapter here for you, but an entire chapter basically describing God. Again, not one word of hint at the idea of a trinity or the idea that God is to be understood as taking on human form. First Chronicles 17, verse 20, O Lord, there is none like you, Neither is there any God beside you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. The next page, Isaiah chapter 45. Assemble yourselves, in verse 20, and come. Draw near together that you are escaped of the nations. They have no knowledge that set up wood of their graven image and pray unto a God that cannot save. Another, again, I don't think it's talking about Jesus, but it could easily be submitted as a verse that seems to allude to Christianity, having a wooden graven image and praying to a God that cannot save. Tell you and bring them near, yea, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from ancient time? Who has told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. This passage in Isaiah, and many of the chapters we just saw in Isaiah, just repeat over and over and over again, God is saying, that's all there is, folks, just me. There's nothing else. Hosea chapter 11, verse 9. I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not return to destroy Ephraim. For I am God and not man. God here says, I am not a man. 
the Holy One in the midst of you, and I will not enter into the city. We see this idea repeated in 1 Samuel 16, verse 29, and also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he, God, is not a man that he should repent. The same idea in Numbers 23, verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and shall he not do it? Or has he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Three times the Bible has just told us God is not a man. Now, if the intention of God was to reveal himself as a man, if that was the divine intention, why would the Bible mislead us by telling us God is not a man? Right? If, again, if the whole thrust of the knowledge of God is that God is going to be understood in a, as a human being, then God seems to preclude that by telling us here three times, I am not a man. Exodus chapter 20, if you wanted to find a passage where God speaks about himself, this is a great one. Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make unto you any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that's in the earth beneath or that's in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I am the Lord your God, a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Again, God here introducing himself to the Jewish people. And again, not making one clue, not even a hint, that we're to understand God as having three parts, or having human form. Deuteronomy chapter 4, one of the more important chapters in the Bible. And the Lord spoke unto you out of the midst of the fire. This describes the revelation at Mount Sinai. You heard the voice of the words, but saw no form, no similitude. Only you heard a voice. So God tells us here, remember, you didn't see anything at Mount Sinai. Nothing was shown to you physically. You only heard a voice. And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform even the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them upon the two tablets of stone. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that you might do them in the land you go over to possess it. Take you therefore good heed unto yourselves, for you saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spoke unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire. It just said this a few verses earlier, that we didn't see anything. But Moses here repeats it, again, to show how important it is. He says, be very careful, right? Take good heed that you didn't see anything, no form, only heard a voice. Lest you corrupt yourselves and make a graven image, the form of any figure, the likeness of a male or female. Take heed unto yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make you a graven image or the likeness of anything which the Lord God has forbidden to you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. And the Bible goes on to say that God despises idolatry. He's a God that is jealous of his relationship with the Jewish people. He sees idolatry as a form of spiritual adultery. That's what idolatry is. It's giving our hearts, it's giving our worship, it's giving our obedience and our allegiance to something other than the creator of every molecule in the universe. The Bible tells us that we're only to give our attention, our loyalty, our feelings, our commitment, our love, our worship, only to the creator of every molecule, every atom, in the universe, and not to anything that was a created being. We worship only the creator, not any of his creations. Jesus was not the creator because he was a created human being. He was born to human parents. Exodus chapter 34, for you shall worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Deuteronomy 7 says the same thing, that God detests and hates idolatry. We say the same thing in Jeremiah 25. Do not go after other gods to serve them and to worship them and provoke 
me not to anger with the works of your hands, and I will do you no hurt, yet you have not hearkened unto me, says the Lord. You might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. The Bible repeatedly speaks about idolatry as something that gets God very, very angry. Now, how does the Bible describe the Messiah? We know that there are many passages in the Bible that clearly speak about the Messiah. And how do we know that a passage is clearly speaking about the Messiah? It's when everyone agrees that it's speaking about the Messiah. If you have a passage where all Jews and all Christians agree that it's speaking about the Messiah, you can be pretty sure that that's what the passage is speaking about. And when a passage has a lot of disagreement about who it's referring to, when Jews dispute the Christian idea, and usually you should know, when Jews dispute the Christian idea, Christians usually disagree among themselves over those same verses. But here are verses where everyone agrees that they're speaking about the Messiah. Let's see what the Bible says. Isaiah chapter 11. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, and of the fear of the Lord. And he will be filled with a spirit of fear of the Lord. Now, if God, through Isaiah, wanted to make it clear to us that the Messiah would be God himself, why would Isaiah say that this Messiah would be someone who fears God? By telling us that the Messiah will be someone who fears God, it's very, very clear that this person is not God. People who are afraid of themselves, we don't want to get too close to them. So Isaiah here is telling us not that the Messiah will be God, but the Messiah will be someone who fears God. Jeremiah chapter 30, also a passage describing the Messiah. Alas, the day is great, and none is like it. It's a, day, it's a time of Jacob's trouble, but he'll be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off his neck, and will burst your bonds, and strangers will no more serve themselves of him, but they will serve the Lord their God, and David their king, who I will raise up unto them. Very, very important to observe here. The Bible is differentiating, is distinguishing between God and the Messiah. The Bible is not telling you that the Messiah is God. It speaks about the Lord their God, A, and B, and then David their king, but it's not telling you that David, their king, which is a term for the Messiah, is God. It's important to again recognize that the scripture here distinguishes between God and this descendant of David. And the Bible does this many times. For example, Ezekiel chapter 34, another messianic prophecy. And I will set up one shepherd over them and they will feed them. Even my servant David, he will feed them and he will be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. But my servant David will be a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken it. Here again, God distinguishes between himself and David, who will be the Messiah. The descendant of David is not God. It's distinguished here, separated, differentiated from God. The same thing in Ezekiel chapter 37. Again, another very, very critical, central messianic prophecy. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions, but I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned, and I will cleanse them so they will be my people, and I will be their God, and David my servant will be their king. So God speaks about his relationship to the Jewish people, that God will be our God, but in addition, or consecutive with that, or parallel to that, is that we will have David, God's servant, as our king. Again, the Bible here could have made it very, very clear 
that the servant of David, this descendant of David, will be God. But it doesn't. It distinguishes between the servant David and God. The same is taught to us in Hosea chapter 3. For the children of Israel will abide many days without a king, without a prince, without a sacrifice, and without an image, and without an aphod, and without trafim. And afterward, the children of Israel will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. And they shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. So again, the scripture distinguishes between God and David who will be the king. Again, same concept on the next page in Psalm chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and their rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed one, against the Lord's Messiah. So again, there's God and there's the Messiah, but it's not one being. And so we see... Every Jewish prayer service, three times a day, Jews conclude their prayer services by quoting Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9. The Lord will be king over all the earth on that day. The Lord will be one and his name will be one. This is a messianic prophecy which importantly speaks not about the person of the Messiah. We learned previously that most messianic prophecies describe what the world will look like when the Messiah is here. What the world is going to look like when the Messiah is here. And what is that going to be? That everyone on the planet is going to believe in God. And this passage does not speak about the Messiah. There's no mention of the descendant of David here. This is simply telling us that in the time of the Messiah, every person is going to believe in God. I believe, and we only scratched the surface just now, there are many, many dozens more similar passages. I believe that any simple and honest and straightforward reading of the Jewish Bible does not lend itself, does not lead us to believing that God is a trinity or that God is to be understood as coming to the world in human form. And I will tell you, that I am now being contacted regularly, I suppose because of the internet, and because we now have a worldwide exposure, that I am literally being contacted several times a month now by Christians, people who are church-going Christians, who tell me I cannot worship Jesus as God. I cannot believe Jesus is God. These are not Christians that are being hounded by Jewish missionaries. These are Christians that have simply been reading the Bible and coming to the very disturbing conclusion that they are in serious error. And I'm not telling you about a few people. I'm telling you a growing number of people. It used to be I would hear from one or two people a month. Now it's one or two people a week. And it's increasing. And my colleagues are telling me the same thing. That as knowledge increases... Christians are coming to realize that their teachings about God and Jesus are simply serious, serious theological errors. Here you have an interesting book I've quoted from called Why You Should Believe in the Trinity. Now let me tell you about how this book came to be written. There is a Christian denomination that does not believe in the Trinity. They're called the Jehovah's Witnesses. The Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe in a Trinity. And they published a book called Why You Should Not Believe in the Trinity. So there's a Christian theologian, an evangelical scholar named Bowman. I believe that's his name. He published a book called Why You Should Believe in the Trinity. So this is a book where the entire thrust of the book is to prove that Christians have to believe in the Trinity. Yet he states here unequivocally, all Trinitarians agree that the ideas about God expressed in the doctrine of the Trinity are not found directly in the Old Testament. Thank you very much, Mr. Bowman. Basically, he's admitting, again, as a Trinitarian, that these beliefs are not really going to be found in the Jewish Bible. And I would say, why not? If God wanted to make it clear 
that we're to understand him as having three parts, or as having human form, or that the Messiah would be God. Why didn't the Bible ever say it clearly and unambiguously? And not just once, but why didn't it say it dozens and dozens of times? But here, someone writing a book about the topic of the Trinity, admitting that it's not really going to be found in the Jewish Bible. Now, we'll go one step further. Does the Christian Bible teach the Trinity? Clearly. Does the Christian Bible clearly teach that Jesus is God? Of one substance with the Father. I don't think it's that clear. Let's look at a few examples. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verse 17. And when he had gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good Master! What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Right? Someone comes to Jesus and says, What do I have to do, good master, to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why call you me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. Why are you referring to me as good? Only God is good. Jesus is not saying here that I am God. And pat him on the head for referring to him as good master. Jesus clearly here distinguishes himself from God. As a matter of fact, by the way, in Matthew chapter 19, I believe, where this same passage occurs, and in the continuation of Mark 10, Jesus says, and if you want to inherit the kingdom of heaven, if you want eternal life, Jesus says, keep the mitzvot, keep the commandments. In Mark chapter 13, Jesus says, heaven and earth shall pass away. But my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knows no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but only the Father. Jesus here distinguishes himself from the Father. He says that that final day, no one knows when it's going to happen. Only the Father, not the Son. So again, if Christianity insists that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are of one substance, Equal, co-equal, equal parts of the Godhead, it's impossible that one part of the Godhead knows information that the other parts of the Godhead do not know. John chapter 14, you have heard how I said unto you, I go away and I come again unto you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said, I go unto the Father, for the Father is greater than I. He doesn't say here that I am equal with the Father. He says the Father is greater than I. John chapter 17, verse 3. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and the Messiah Jesus, who you've sent. Again, here distinguishing between God and Jesus the Messiah. Not equating Jesus the Messiah with the only true God. John chapter 20, verse 17. Jesus said to her, Touch me not, for I have not yet descended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and to your God. Here Jesus refers to God as his God. Right? Clearly distinguishing himself from God. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Again, the Messiah is not God. God is the head over and, the, over and above the Messiah, Christ. 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. Who is that mediator? The man, Christ Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus. But here it distinguishes between God and and the Messiah. It doesn't equate Jesus with God. Again, for there is only one God, but there is one mediator between God and men. Who is that mediator? The man, Jesus. Acts chapter 5. And now I say to you, refrain from these men. We've studied this passage in the past. This is where Peter and the apostles are brought up on basically to be either killed or beaten up by the high court. And Gamaliel says about these followers of Jesus, he says, leave them alone, they're doing nothing wrong. 
And Gamliel basically says, let's take a wait and see attitude. Gamliel says in this chapter, we've seen other movements where people thought that someone was the Messiah. And what happened? Gamliel says that these movements that thought someone was the Messiah fell apart when the Messiah, when their Messiah was killed or died. So Gamliel says in this passage, leave these men alone. They're doing nothing wrong. Don't don't think it's important to, to beat them up. He says, let's take a wait and see approach. We'll see what happens. Now, if Peter and John and James and the apostles were worshiping Jesus as God, if these were the same as today's evangelical Christians who kept Sabbath on Sunday and who ate pork with no problem and worshiped Jesus as God, would Gamliel have said, leave them alone, they're doing nothing wrong. They would have been doing the worst things in Judaism. He wouldn't have said they're doing nothing wrong if they were worshiping Jesus as God. He says here in Acts 5, verse 38, And now I say to you, refrain from these men and leave them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. If it's not a true movement, it's going to fall apart by itself. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest happily you be found even to be fighting against God. And we saw indeed that this movement did fall apart. By the year 200, there are basically no more Jews who are Torah observant and simply believe that Jesus is the Messiah and not God. And probably post the year 200 or 250, virtually all followers of Jesus are Gentiles. They don't keep the commandments. They worship Jesus as God. It's a movement that has basically disappeared and has been resurrected by Paul as a totally different movement.